Okay, in our last screencast, yeah, I know that's sad, uh, we're going to talk about random numbers, Monte Carlo, important sampling, these sorts of things. Now for random numbers themselves, there really isn't too much to say. We're just using built-in routines. Okay? And in fact, we've already been doing this. We're just going to continue using the same ones. I will, however, mention that there are some sophisticated uh, routines that exist in the sophisticated module SciPy stats. Just like the Fourier transform with signal processing, SciPy signal, that contains a lot of things, this contains a lot of things too. Okay? And we're not going to talk about this in any detail. But if you're interested in statistical uh, tools, statistical processing of data and whatnot, uh, this contains pretty much everything we need to know. This is still under development, so things are continuously being added to this. But there's all kinds of things in here in terms of continuous and discrete distributions. For the continuous distributions, there's all kinds of them, many of which maybe we've never even heard of, but there's Gaussians and gamma distributions and there should be the chi-squared distribution in here. <coughs> okay and all sorts of other ones, so just tons of them. Then there's discrete distributions like the binomial distribution, uh, which we're presumably familiar with, Poisson distribution. Okay. Lots of statistical um, routines for doing processing and whatnot, okay, modeling, all kinds of stuff. So there's a huge amount of stuff there. If, again, if you're interested or need to do such things, it's worthwhile looking at that and looking at documentation and examples of how to use that because it's very powerful. For our purposes, we're going to, again, just use routines from NumPy. In NumPy, these routines are contained in random. Well, it turns out the ones that we actually need are automatically loaded in PyLab, so we don't need to go through random. But this module exists, okay? and what do you know? It's for random number generation. So again, a handful of utility routines for doing things like shuffling arrays randomly and whatnot. Okay? And getting different types of random numbers. The routines that we're familiar with are RAND for uniformly distributed values and RANDN for normally distributed. Again, these are, they call them compatibility, but really these are just uh, useful routines uh, for common things that we want to do. RAND INT's also common if we wanted to generate random integers in some range. This also contains a large number of distributions, not quite as many as in the stats module, but a lot of things that we often want to use. So again, the Poisson distribution is here, for example, and well, we may or may not recognize many of the other ones, but they're there. Okay. And again, these really are using the transformation method on well-known distributions. How do we generate random numbers from them? Okay. Uh, so and again, oops, there's a few other things. I guess one other thing that I wanted to mention was about state. We mentioned that we need to pick a seed, which is really setting up the internal, the you know, initial configuration of our generator that's stored in the state. We can get the state of the generator using get state. We can set the state using set state. So if we want to, for example, store the state um, so that we can use it again later to reproduce what we've done, get state allows me to do that and uh, to get it and then set state to restore it back to where it was. Again, we're not going to, to really use any of those things, but I just wanted to point out that they exist. <clears throat> okay, so as our first problem that we want to do, let's talk about uh, generating random numbers uniformly distributed inside a circle. Okay, now, that doesn't sound too hard. A circle is easy to generate. In fact, let's create a unit circle. To do that, we'll uh, pick theta from 0 to 2 pi. We know how to calculate the x and y coordinates since it's a unit circle has radius 1, so x is just cosine theta, y is just sine theta. We can plot that. <coughs> okay, let's plot it as a red line. Let's make it kind of thick. So there we go. That's a circle. That doesn't look like a circle. It doesn't look like an ellipse because notice the aspect ratio of this plot window is rectangular. Okay, the x direction is bigger than the y direction. Well, we've encountered things like this before, and we can change the aspect ratio. For those of us that were in class before uh, fall break, we know about getting the current axes and using things in it. Okay, We could also do this with plot itself. If you look at the documentation for plot, we could have told it to set the aspect ratio. But after the fact, we can set the aspect ratio to be equal force it to update, and now we see, yes, that really is a circle. Okay, so let me shrink this a little bit. <coughs> okay. 
So here is, we're trying to uniformly sample inside this region. Well, let's do this by picking a certain number of points. Let's pick 100,000. Our first thought might be, well, let's pick theta randomly distributed between 0 and 2 pi. Let's pick r randomly distributed between 0 and 1. That's what rand does. We know how to calculate x. That's r cosine theta. We know how to calculate y. That's r sine theta. And now let's just plot these. So let's put them as points on here. Let's use the comma because that's the smallest point marker. We've got a lot of them that we want to put on. And so if we do that, this is what we get. Why well, doesn't look randomly distributed to me? Or it doesn't look uniformly distributed, I should say. It is randomly distributed. We can't actually tell if it's random or not. But it doesn't look uniform. Notice there's a lot more points right at the center than there are at the edges. So this naive attempt that we made to generate randomly, sorry, uniformly distributed values inside the circle did not work. Okay. To verify that that didn't work, or to confirm what we mean by this didn't work, let's use um, the rejection method, because we know that that will work. So let me create a new figure. <clears throat> and in this figure, let's also put our circle. Okay, Let's do the same business of setting the aspect ratio and shrinking this a little bit. Okay. Now, we can just pick random values. Okay. Um, I won't go through the error that I always make, which is this one. This picks a random x value from 0 to 1. Okay. And we'll do the same thing for y. That would be 0 to 1. That would only pick in this quadrant. So we really want to pick x between um, minus 1 and 1, and we can do that in the following way, and same for y in this way. Just to verify that that's true, let's plot this. Okay, We can see that this region is uniformly sampled. Okay, this, These points look pretty uniform. Of course, by eye, we can see that there's a few points in here that are more dense than others. That's the nature of a random sample. Okay. But in general, where these little blobs appear is also appears to be kind of everywhere, kind of uniformly distributed. And so that's, again, what we mean by a uniform distribution. Okay, I saved its name so that I can remove that. And now let's do re the rejection method. To do the rejection method, well, we want to re restrict ourselves to the points inside the circle. So I can calculate the radius where each one of these points appears. And we can only keep the ones where that radius is less than or equal to 1. Now here I'm using r squared because whether r is less than 1 or r squared is less than 1 is the same thing. So that's just a little easier. Didn't need to take a square root. Uh, so the point is, is that these should just be inside the circle. We can look to see how many of them there are. And there's about 78,000 out of 100,000. In other words, about 78% of them fell inside versus outside. Okay. <coughs> So we can now plot those okay, inside the circle. So all these should appear inside the circle. There we go. And lo and behold, this is nice uniformly sampled inside the circle. It looks very different than our original figure. Okay, where here there were too many points at the center. So the rejection method clearly has worked, and it should always work. The question is, can we use all of the points instead of having to throw some of them away? So can I turn this distribution into a distribution that looks more like this? And the answer is, of course we can. Okay. If we go back to what we know about a circle, if we integrate over a circle, we know that we write the area element of a circle as r dr d theta. Okay. Notice there's an extra r in here. What this is saying is that there's an extra weighting for r. Okay? If we interpret this as a probability distribution or a probability density, okay, then what we're really saying is the probability density is r. For theta, it is uniform, because there was no theta dependence. But for r, there's this extra dependence, well, r. Okay? Well, we talked about in class how we come up with a probability distribution that goes like P, the probability p of r is equal to r, or we did p of y is equal to y. And we saw that to transform from a uniform distribution to this distribution, we take the square root. Okay. 
So you should review that from class. But what we showed is that if we take the square root of our uniformly distributed numbers, we're going to reuse the same ones we made to produce this plot, but now we're just going to take their square root. Okay. <clears throat> if we do that, we can now recalculate what x is. We can recalculate what y is. Okay, let's go back to figure 1. Let's remove these bad points. Okay. And let's plot the new points. Okay, now we can do it this way. Okay. <clears throat> and what do you know? Those are uniformly distributed. Okay, if we compare that to what we have here, it looks very similar. In fact, this one should look a little darker because now there really are 100,000 points in here, whereas here we had to reject some that fell out here. There's only whatever, the 78,000 or so in, in here. Okay. And so just using this transformation method allows me to generate uniformly distributed points inside, in this case, the circle. OK, so that's great. You're going to do a similar thing in the homework uh, for the sphere. The other thing that we talked about was importance sampling, or I guess we'll really talk about on when in class on Wednesday. Okay. So as an example of that, let's suppose that we want to do the integral of this function. Okay, x to the minus 1 third plus x over 10, integrate from 0 to 1. Okay, well, we can do this analytically, and the answer is 31 over 12. Okay, so we're going to do this with Monte Carlo integration as we'll do in a second. And we're also going to do this using importance sampling. Okay, this is what we're going to discuss more in class. Uh, for this, we'll, let's use a probability distribution, a probability distribution that's proportional to y to the minus 1 third. Okay, well, I've figured out the normalization. You should verify that that works for you. <coughs> and I've calculated the transformation. Here's the transformation. You should verify that you can perform this calculation yourself. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay, what does that mean? Well, let's first define our function f, and let's define our probability p. Okay, so those are the functions that we had over here. Okay. Let's generate some random numbers now between 0 and 1. Let's apply the transformation. So the transformation is that y is equal to x to the 1 fifth. <coughs> Sorry, x to the 3 halves, or 1.5. Well, the first thing we should do is verify that this actually worked. So to do that, let's create some bins between 0 uh, and 1. Let's pick 100 of them, and let's histogram them. Now, to histogram them, I prefer doing it in steps instead of bars. I don't know. To me, it just looks nicer. But the important thing is, is that we want it to be normalized, because this is a normalized probability distribution. So we want a normalized probability here. So let's create that histogram, and there it is. Now to verify that this is correct, we should plot uh, our probability distribution evaluated at some set of points. I'm going to use the same ones as the bins. It really doesn't matter, but at points along here. Okay? And, our pro and this distribution, this line, should lie right on top of them. Lo and behold, it does. Now you'll notice that this did give us an error, division by 0. That's because one of our bins is 0. And if you look carefully, you'll see that there's no value here. The line stops here. It's because we tried to evaluate this at 0. And 1 over 0 to the 1 third, or 0 to the minus 1 third, is not defined. So if we were doing this more carefully, we would have avoided 0 and picked more points. But anyway, the important thing here is we were just throwing this up so that we could see that, yes, this black line really does follow the distribution. And so we really have calculated this transformation correctly. Okay, So that's how we confirm and how we always get this right. <clears throat> OK, so we wanted to do this integral. Okay, And we know what the value should be, so let's store that in something, i true. Okay, let's look at the value. If we're going to do this via Monte Carlo integration, Monte Carlo integration really is the evaluating, uh, summing up the function, evaluating at all these random points we picked x. Okay, remember, x is uniformly distributed, divided by the number of points, or multiplied by delta x. Delta x, in this case, is just 1 over n. Um, and if we do that, we get a value. Notice it's pretty close to the true value. 
True value is 1.55. This is 1.5508. Okay. In fact, we can calculate the absolute error. So divide this by I true. Okay, reasonably good. In fact, pretty good. <coughs> okay. Alternatively, we can calculate this using importance sampling. Okay. Again, let's just write out the formula. We're going to discuss this more in class on Wednesday. So prior to that, you'll just have to accept that this is how we calculate um, the integral using a different probability distribution, p. Okay, now we evaluate this at y, and we normalize it by the probability of getting that particular y divided by n. <coughs> okay. Notice that we get also 1.55. Turns out to be a little bit closer. Okay. We can calculate the error in this. Okay. We see that it's somewhat better. In this case, it's actually not that much better. I mean, okay, factor of three or four, which is still pretty good because notice we're using exactly the same random values. Okay, we haven't calculated new random values. We're using the exact same values. Just by using them in a smarter way, in a better way, we can get a better answer. Now, this wasn't a huge, huge improvement. It's still a very good improvement. I Typically, when I run this, I find I get maybe a factor of 10 improvement. So let's just run it one more time just to see what, what happens. <clears throat> okay. uh, so here we get some error in this. Okay. And if we use the error from important sampling, okay, this is more what I'm used to seeing. Well, actually, this one's even more extreme than I'm used to seeing. Here the error was about 10 to the minus 3. Here it's about 10 to the minus 5. We actually got two orders of magnitude improvement. Again. This is all based on random numbers, so the amount of improvement is can fluctuate quite a bit, as we can see, from a factor of a few to a factor of, of 100. But the point is that by using exactly the same set of random numbers, by using them in a different way, we can get a much better estimate, uh, or e at least a better estimate, uh, than we would uh, without doing this. And that's one of the important things about, and useful things about this importance sampling. It's something that we will explore more and discuss more in class.